To do a fuel pressure release, you need to move the fuel pump fuse, which is shown in the picture right here. After you have removed the fuel pump fuse, you want to start the engine over until it stalls. After it has stalled, you want to start the engine two or three more times to make sure the fuel pressure is released. Move all your spark plugs and wires. You want to pull up on it and put some needle edge pliers in. Pull up on it so you don't tear up your spark plug wire. And after you have removed that, you will remove all your spark plugs on all four. You need to remove the distributor plug shown in this picture right here. If you have removed your spark plugs and wires, you want to start on number one cylinder and you will insert your compression tester into the number one cylinder. And after you have installed your compression tester, you will have a helper inside the car pressing the gas all the way to the floor while they start the engine and you count 1-1000, 2-1000, 3-1000, 4-1000, 5-1000. And we have right about 190, which is very good. When you get done with the compression test, do another fuel pressure release. When you're going to remove your hood, you have uh, two 12 millimeter bolts that bolt through those two holes there and screw into the hood on the bottom of the hood. All right, to remove the battery, you got to remove the negative side first. It's a 10 millimeter nut on the positive and the negative side. And you also have 10 millimeter nuts on the bracket that holds it down. But make sure you remove the negative first before the positive. All right, on your intake, you have your MAF sensor. You need to disconnect it, just pressing the button and pull out. Then you have your uh, air temperature sensor. You need to disconnect it as well. Then you have a 10 millimeter screw in here in the fan shroud. You need to disconnect that as well. On the intake, you got this screw here you need to remove. Hooks to the fan shroud. And then your next bolt is the one on the end here that you need to remove. Both these are 10 millimeter screws. And next you have eight millimeter clamp that clamps the intake manifold to the mass. I'm gonna take, loosen that off. You don't actually take it off, just loosen it up. All right, next you need to remove the hoses coming on your intake manifold. Well, not your intake manifold, but your intake itself. Squeeze these two clamps and Kind of a pain to get off sometimes. Ah, there we go. And then next, you got another eight millimeter clamp. You need to loosen up. Then you get and pull the whole intake off. So you need to go ahead and remove this clamp right here. It has an 8 millimeter clamp on it. Remove this uh, breather hose here that goes to the valve cover to squeeze the clamps on it and pull it off. On your air box you have uh, four of these little clamps. You just pull them back. You got two on each side. Two more down there. And just pull your whole box off. Then you have your filter. Remove that. Then on your air box, you got this uh, vent tube here. You got to remove. It's got these little plastic clamps on it. They just look like this. Just 
little things with teeth on them, so you just pull them right up. And just right here where it connects to the vent, it just pretty much slides in there. So it just pops off. On the bottom side of your air box, you got three 10 millimeter nuts you need to remove. You got one up top here. And you got two on the bottom. And the whole thing just slides right up. And you have your vent tubes here, which hooks to the bottom down there. On your top radiator hose, you have a 10 millimeter clamp on the back here on the intake manifold. And you have another 10 millimeter clamp on the radiator. You can remove those and pull the radiator hose off. It's probably still going to drain a little bit of coolant, so make sure you have rags for that. And the same with the bottom hose. Bottom hose, you have a 10 millimeter clamp right there, which connects to the water neck. It goes down to the very bottom of the radiator. It connects down there with a 10 millimeter clamp. Okay, when you're going to remove your hoses off your uh, canister, you got two that run across the radiator shroud here, and then they run underneath the throttle body. As you see right here, you have three. What I had to do, since everything was hard to get to, I had to remove my top radiator hose, which have a uh, 10 millimeter clamps on them. On the top radiator hose and the bottom radiator hose, they both have the 10 millimeter clamps on them. And uh, I had to remove my box, my air box, and my clamp for it to be able to get to this. But you have the three here. You can either remove them from the canister or from the motor, either way. And uh, just take one with the other. This uh, one is the one that hooked your uh, air box. And then the other two is the one that goes straight to the canister. You're going to want to pull your fan, fan shroud off. You have to remove your fan first. It has four 10 millimeter nuts on each side. You got two on top, two on the bottom. You can either turn the motor or get the top ones, or you can get underneath the car and get to the bottom ones, however you want to do it. Okay, you're going to go remove your uh, fan shroud and your radiator and your fan and everything. You got your fan unbolted and everything. It's sitting there because it, it's in, it will get in the way on the water pump pulley, so you gotta leave it in there until you pull the whole thing out. You have a 10 millimeter nut right here, and another 10 millimeter nut right here on these two brackets. They actually hold the radiator down on top. And as soon as you pull those off, the whole bracket will pull up. You need to remove this hose here as well. It goes to the overflow tank. And then you have a, your connector here, which goes to your AC fan. This one and this one connect together. Make sure you disconnect those. You have your radiator hoses disconnected, the bottom one and the top one. I like to take a, a rubber glove and just tie a strap it on there so water won't leak out. Because there's still going to be some water left in there that's going to want to leak out. Just make sure everything's disconnected and everything. And just pull the whole piece out as one unit. After you have the radiator out and everything, there's usually some uh, rubber plugs that sit in these holes right here. They'll either stay on the bottom of the radiator or they'll stay in here. Either way, take them out and put them up somewhere so you won't lose them. This is what your fan shroud looks like when it's out. You have your AC fan in here, which goes to the plug here that you had to disconnect. And basically all it did was just slide out. You gotta pretty much pull it straight up. Because if you don't, it'll get stuck on these sides right here. These sides get stuck on some wires and hoses and things. So just make sure you get those up. You just pull basically pull the whole unit up as one piece. That's the best way to get it out. Uh, next, while you're draining everything, you want to remove your ex your exhaust manifold. You'll start off with your your heat shield. You got a couple 10 millimeter screws. You got one on top here, one here, one here. You have another one down here. Mine's broke off, but there's one supposed to be there. You have two down here. One there and one on the other side. Your uh, O2 sensors are 22 millimeter, the top one and the bottom one. So you want to disconnect them and unscrew them before you actually take the heat shield off. 
and then you have a, another screw down at the bottom down there it's kind of down in there I don't know if you can see it and that should be it it should come off after you got your uh, heat shut off your exhaust manifold you got three 14 millimeter nuts you need to remove from the downpipe you got one right there it's a 14 millimeter and then you have a uh, another one over here on this side yeah, it's hard to see then you also have another one on the other side but you got to get it get to it from the bottom to get it there's another heat shield on the bottom you got to remove to get to that bottom one as well you got this heat shield here to remove to get to the bottom bolt on the downpipe it's two 10 millimeter nuts and the shield will fall off and you'll be able to get the bottom 14 millimeter nut you have two grounds you need to disconnect before you do the manifold and everything because it'll get in your way you have this bracket right here you need to remove it's two 12 millimeter nuts one there and one there just disconnect those first and remove this bracket then you can start with your EGR tube you have your EGR tube connects to it right there it's a 24 millimeter bolt it's pretty tough to get out I'd go ahead and shoot it with some PB blaster or some WD-40 let it sit for a good little while and break it loose if you can't break it loose with opening a wrench just use some uh channel locks or something to get it off and then on your uh, exhaust manifold you got 14 millimeter bolts you have uh, eight of them to take off then you have two 17 millimeter nuts going to the cat one on each side you gotta remove it's just a screw that goes all the way through right here is where uh, your drain cock is located uh, it's a 14 millimeter this is where you need to drain all your coolant out of your block you need to keep panning it because it's going to drain a whole lot of fluid right there. And when you go to put it back on, you need to put some RTV on the end of the threads and torque it down. So you might as well drain your motor oil too while you're down here. It's a 14 millimeter nut as well. Okay, to remove your uh, power steering, well, unhook your power steering and drain it. You need to drain all the fluid out of the reservoir here. You have uh, this hose that comes down hooks to here. It's hooked down with a 8 millimeter clamp. You loosen that and remove the hose and just let it drain off. And then when you get done everything draining, you got a 24 millimeter nut here. It's actually a bolt. You remove that and that removes the hard line from it. So, because this is connected to the car and the pump's connected to the motor, it's going to come out. You're going to want to remove your uh, heater hoses from the car to the motor. They run down here. You have two of them. You have an inlet and an outlet. Right there is where they connect. They both have uh, two 8 millimeter clamps on them that you need to remove. You can leave the other ends on, onto the car where they're going to the firewall. It'll be okay. Be, uh, have you a pan ready for that because that's going to leak fluid as well. Okay, on your throttle cable, you have a. Uh, this is your cruise control. This is your throttle cable right here. You have a uh, 14 millimeter nuts. Just uh, remove the top ones. Make you a mark on them so you know where they're at. I usually just spin mine in reverse one turn, one complete turn, and then pull them off. And then what you gotta do is uh, pull your throttle cable up and let the, uh, let the cable bend out like that. And all you gotta do is just slide the cable out. And this cable here, you gotta get it over that piece there and then slide it out that way and that's it on the draw cable and then you need to remove your fuel lines you got two right here that you need to remove they have screw clamps on them okay when you're going to unplug your alternator that red boot right there is a there's a bolt underneath it. You need to pull that red boot up and remove that bolt. And right below it, there's a wiring connection. You just need to unplug it. And then right there is a ground connection. You need to unscrew that and remove that as well. And then right down here beside the oil filter, you have the oil pressure sending unit. There it is right there. It's got a rubber boot on it right there. You need to remove the rubber boot and uh, disconnect that wiring as well. Then you also have a negative, the battery's negative wire hooks to the manifold right there. You also have a wire connection right down here below the fuel filter. That's your starter motor right there. You have a, a nut right there, I believe it was 12 millimeter, that you have to take off. 
has the it's like the alternator has the boot on it you need to pull the boot back and unscrew it and remove it and you also had this wiring connection too went to it you need to disconnect it you need to disconnect your wires before you actually remove it from the car because it's not necessarily heavy but it's a little heavy if you're not expecting it to be and then going up top you have one beside the injector right there and then you have your four injector plugs you have a big plug right here on the front of the manifold and then you have another plug right here on the front of the manifold and then there's also let's see if you can see those you have one right there another one right there and another one right there and then also on these right here you need to remove your your tie, tie downs right here just put a screwdriver on the end pull it out and then it'll come down you have your 200 distributor you had a ground wire that hooked right here you had your O2 sensor connector on the wiring harness we had another connector right here right beside the throttle body it had this uh, little metal ring on it basically it just wraps around the, the plug there and that's what holds it on so you just pull this off around the plug and the plug will slide right out and also you have a another ground connection on the motor right there you can remove that bolt to remove that ground connection okay here in the car you need to drain your transmission fluid from the drain plug right here on the left hand side the driver side it's a 19 millimeter nut you need to loosen it let it drain it's going to take a while to drain there's a good bit in there On the passenger side of the transmission, you have the sensor right here. You can cut the wire off right there. You're not going to be using that one. Okay, on the back of the transmission, you have this sensor right here. It needs to be cut. You can cut it off because you're not going to use it. And it's going to be really hard to get that out. So you might as well just go ahead and cut it off right there. You can see that connector up there. It's really hard to get to but you need to disconnect it because it's your uh, crank angle sensor and you're going to need that for your 5 speed I'll go on that a little further but when removing the harness you need to disconnect that rather than cut it and also there's one more sensor right there you can cut that wire too because you're not going to be using it anymore All right, on the transmission, you have uh, three wires you're going to cut. You have one right here, which you got to cut off. Another one right here, it's going to be cut off. See? And then you have this sensor here you need to cut the wire on. You can actually pull it out, but it's too far to pull out when it's inside the car. So you're going to have to cut it off. Okay, you have your shift lever right here. It runs up to the actual automatic shifter up in the car. All you do is uh, pull this carter pin out right here, and it releases the thing that holds the this, this wire, right, this uh, metal bracket right here. It releases that, and you can, uh, remove the shifter up up top. Then also over here, you have your, uh, your switch, which is lever right here is the one that connects back to the the shift lever that we. Let's talk about removing the carter pin and the cable on it. It runs to right there. That's the that lever that goes back there and it runs here to here. Alright, this is your uh, shifter rod. It basically hooks the automatic shifter to the transmission. And you have two ends. You got this end and this end. Which they have a, a carter pin that holds them onto, the, onto each end. On the car, these carter pins, you got to take some needle nose pliers. You need to grab the end and pull out and then slide it off. Just like that. And then they both ends will just pop right out. They have a few washers and things like that on it. And then it'll come right off. Right above the exhaust tube mounting bracket and the cross member, you have your automatic speed sensor you need to disconnect the wiring for that and then over here to the left you have your, your O2 sensor 
wire needs to disconnect that and you also need to remove your O2 sensor from your exhaust which is right there also when you're down in the car you have the exhaust tube mounting bracket which connects to the exhaust over here you need to disconnect it from from the cat there and then you can just leave all the rest of it hooked up to the to the mount if you want to or you can take it off too if you're going to a, a bigger header then you, you're probably not going to, be able to use this because they're usually bigger in diameter so they won't fit over so you won't be able to use the bracket there but you can try it and see then you have your drive shaft where it connects to the differential the back of the car you got two I mean well, four nuts these on this side don't actually turn because it's locked in through there so you actually remove this nut on this side Let me get a better shot of that there's four of them just break them loose with a 14 millimeter opening wrench and probably like a, a bar over the wrench for better leverage put your uh, e-brake on and break the two bottom ones and release your e-brake and spin the tire to get the other top two and spin them off and then pull the drive shaft down you have two bolts there that you need to remove there's two more on the other side they're 12 millimeter nuts they uh it's just a support right here for so if your uh, drive shaft ever broke or whatever it just kind of falls on top of there you need to remove that then you have your center bearing where it hooks to the car you have a nut on each side they're uh, 17 millimeter nuts that's where it hooks it to the car so you remove that and you get the plate off right behind it and have it unhooked from differential you'll just slide it out like back towards the rear of the car just grab both ends of it because it's going to be flexible because it's got the joints on it just pull it out of the rear of the transmission and just slide it out from under the car okay for the automatic drive shaft I went ahead and pulled it off the car because it's going to be easier for you to see this from out from under the car but everything's set up just like it would be under the car first thing you need to do is remove the bolts and nuts that hook it to the differential you have four 14 millimeter nuts and bolts basically all it's got to do the nut that goes in right here on this side locks down so it don't turn so all you do is remove the nut on the other side and then they slide out but uh, on the automatics you need to put it the car in drive and spin the back tire so that the whole drive shaft will spin get the two on the bottom then spin the tires over get the two on the top of course you gotta lock your e-brake down put it back in park to get the other side to break them loose then when you get that done go ahead and uh, remove your center bearing bolts which are 17 millimeters two on each there's one on each side and then when you get that off you can remove this plate right here it's two 12 millimeter nuts on this side and one 12 millimeter nut on this side and pull that off then just grab the whole drive shaft and uh, just slide the whole thing back slide it out Watch out for uh, some transmission fluid to come out the shaft up in the front though because a little bit will come out still. When you're going to remove your center console and your automatic shifter, you have two screws removed right there in the little compartment. Then after you pull your plate off, you just pull up on it. It's got these uh, two little clips on the back side. You see that, yeah, there's two clips right there and the other two are just flipped up. Mine's already broke off on the end, so be careful not to break those clips off. Well, of course, you're not going to use this one anyways because it's automatic. The five-speed has a different one. You'll have two two more screws removed on the front side of it, and then you'll be able to pull the whole thing. Well, before you pull it up, you'll, you'll halfway pull it up. If you have a window controls, I mean mirror controls, you need to un unplug the harness for them before you pull the console all the way out. All right here's my uh, harness connector for the mirror controls after you have that off you have a uh, four screws that you need to remove one on each side of it also forgot to add uh, you can pull your ashtray out to help you get the the surround off the shifter the shifter trim it'll help you pull the pull that off if you remove your ashtray first you need to disconnect this harness here on the back of the shifter then you have a uh, This wire right here has a small carter pin on it. I don't know if you can see it in this hole. You need to remove that carter pin. 
That rod there is what releases your key when you have the car in park. Okay, after you have it moved, this is the carter pin that was in the in the rod right here. If uh, after you get that removed, and you have your uh, your shifter over the hole. It's sealed in, so after you have it unscrewed and everything undone, just kind of pull it to the side a little bit, and it'll it'll pull loose. And you can pull it out. Just make sure you got your harness removed, and you have this removed. The uh, plastic part of it right here, the little holder, goes in this little metal holder right here. It slides, this slides down on there. And then the, uh, the rod, the hole in the rod here, hooks to the little plastic piece in there. It just slides over it. That's it, then you just pull the whole thing out. After you've uh, pulled your wire out, that hooks to the shifter for the to remove the key. It hooks on the back of the ignition back here, back of this white box. You have this little black bracket. Actually sits on there on the bottom of it like that, slides up onto it. Just pull this back and press down on it, and that's what will release your. Uh, this is the other end of the rod that hooked to the shifter. It just slides back out of this box right here, and you can remove that whole, the whole linkage there. Over here on the driver's side of the transmission, you have your uh, coolant line, which runs up there to, uh, I believe it was a 19 millimeter bolt too. And it runs along the transmission here until you hit, uh, you hit a few various, I believe they're 12 millimeter screws that bolt it down. You got one right above there. It runs down to the front of the transmission where you have two of them. You have one there and another one there. I'll slide under here to the passenger side of the car uh, where it runs into another 19 millimeter where it connects to the transmission. You need to unhook that. Then it runs up into another 12 millimeter screw you unscrew that. It runs through the front by the motor mount all the way to the front of the car. But you have another screw over there, which and you have the two there, which run to rubber lines to the bottom of the radiator, which I don't have hooked up anymore. All right, on your coolant lines, you have a 19 millimeter bolt right here, which you remove that and it pulls it off. You have a uh, 10 millimeter screw here for this bracket that holds this side on and then it'll come off. Two more 10 millimeter bolts you need to remove in front of the transmission pan here and here to uh, get the coolant lines off the bottom side. Another 19 millimeter bolt here you need to remove for the line and also another bracket which is a 12 millimeter bolt. Last you had a 10 millimeter bolt right here this bracket beside the oil pan and the whole coolant line should come off. Might have to bend it just a little bit, but you're not going to use it again, so don't worry about it. Then you have it. Coolant line's off. All right, when you're removing your uh, transmission mount and motor mounts, you need to put a jack underneath the transmission like we have it here. I have it under the, the pan. You can uh, put it anywhere, really, but I'm not worried about messing it up. You need to put it there so it don't fall down on you because it's going to lower a lot. So after you remove your mount and your motor mounts, you can uh, you can remove the jack then. And on your uh, transmission mount, you have two bolts on each side, one on one this side and one on the other. That releases it from the car. And there's also a slide under here. Two more up in the hole there on each side. And those holes that uh, need to remove those and the ones in the middle there is the ones that connect to uh, to the transmission mount itself. You can leave those on so they leave the transmission mount on. Alright this is your transmission mount with your uh, cross member. You have uh, two nuts that go down these holes that holds the transmission mount to the transmission. They're 14 millimeter. You need to remove those first. 
and uh, have your jack jacked under your transmission because when you remove these bolts on the outside, it's going to fall off. You have uh, two 17 millimeter nuts on each side that you need to remove, and the transmission mount should come off. Then you have your gussets you need to remove. Got the four bolts on the bottom there, which on the passenger side you have two more up there. And then on the driver's side, you have two more right there. The driver's side has a smaller gusset and the passenger side has the bigger gusset. All right, next you got your, you got your gusset bolts you need to remove. There's four 14 millimeter bolts, all right there. And here on the driver's side, you have two more 14 millimeter bolts you need to remove for the gusset. The passenger side, you have two more 14 millimeter bolts you need to remove for the gusset. Next, you have your uh, crank angle sensor, which uh, you have a connector that hooks to the harness right here. It's really hard to get to because your, your uh, check tube's in the way. Uh, a 10 millimeter bolt that hooks to this plate right here. You need to remove those. And then this whole sensor just slides out of the transmission. And that's what it looks like. You cannot leave it in there because if you leave it in there, you'll break this because it's really, really fragile. And it'll break and it'll hit the flywheel or flex plate or whatever when you're pulling it off the, the transmission off the motor. So you need to remove this whole piece. It's a pain in the butt to get out, but you'll be able to do it. And most of, the, most of the transmission bolts I got off with a regular extension and then a wobble and then your 14-millimeter uh, socket. But the ones on, one, a couple on top, like the top right one, the one with the hoop on it for the hose, I used two extensions and I was able to get that. And when you can't break them loose, I use this breaker bar right here. It's basically just a, a pipe that I put on the end of it. Works real well. I got them all off of that. I had no problems. Okay, on the driver's side of your transmission, you have your crank angle sensor up top there. You need to remove that. It's got a plate on top of there. It needs to be removed first, and then it has a little screw that screws to the bell housing, actually, to the 10 millimeter screw. You need to remove that, which will remove the plate, and then you can slide the crank angle sensor up and out. The damage it, it's very breakable and easy to break. And you have two bell housing bolts up top. You have one there, one there, and then of course you had your four gusset bolts on the bottom. And then over here on the passenger side, let's see, you had the two starter motor, bolt, starter motor bolts, one there and one above that tube there. You have another one right here. Okay, up top here, I'm going to show you your two bell housing bolts and the crank angle sensor. Looking behind the motor, okay, uh, it's going to be a little hard to show you all this. Let's see. Right there in that dent, and there's one bell housing bolt that you need to get to. I mean, there's a lot of things going to get in your way, really. You got the AC and your EGR tube there. Um, all right, right here to the side, that's uh, that's your crank angle sensor right there, the top plate. The bolt is on the passenger side of that. It's a 10 millimeter. It's, I ain't gonna be able to get it. It's actually right, would be right there if I could show it to you. And also, you can't see the bolt neither, but you can see this tube right here. It's called the breather tube. There's actually a bolt connected in the bell housing there. It's actually hooked through that which is holding that bracket up too. So you have those two on top there. That's how you're going to get them out. It's not going to be easy to do. I can assure you of that. But it is doable. Next on the bell housing you have a 14 millimeter here to be removed. Had the bracket for a coolant line on it. All right, next you need to pull this clamp off and just pull the hose off the vent tube there. And then you have your 14 millimeter ball on here. Next you have this one on, the, it's a 14 millimeter bolt. It's right above your gusset bolt. You need to 
you remove that one. And then next above it, you have another one. And then next above that, you have another one, which is right beside your crank angle sensor. And that's it. Removing your transmission from under the car, you need a, a transmission jack or use just regular jack stands with a couple friends or whatever to pull it off. What you need to do is uh, you need to grab, unbolt the whole thing and grab it towards the back and kind of like pull it up and down and wiggle it back as you're going. But since we got the whole thing out of the car, I'm going to show you how to do it like that. If you're under the car, the transmission going to be above you, you're going to have to grab it and wiggle it back like that. But you just keep taking it at the bottom of it and just wiggling it back. Until it breaks loose. Then you gotta pull it off the, uh, the converter. And it's off. And you're gonna get a lot of transmission fluid all over the floor too. So be prepared for that. You wanna make sure you break your uh, header to your cat apart so it is able to flex. Make sure you remove your uh, transmission cross member to the chassis so it'll drop down. Loosen your motor mount bolts so it'll still rock back. Remove your uh, complete drive shaft. Also up top here make sure your intake's removed from the motor because it's going to kick back. Fans going to kick back. Anything like that. When you're going to remove this be extra careful. I'm going to pick up on it just wiggle it back, get you some grip on it. Nothing up. Okay, now that you got it out, just slide it out from under the car. As you probably seen, my uh, neutral position switch was still connected, so I had to remove that while it was under there. It's no fun doing this under the car like this, and you can easily hurt yourself. So be extra careful. And if you got someone that can help you, that would be even better. Because as you see, I have to do it by myself, which is very dangerous and not safe in itself, but. You gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. And also watch out for the uh, rear of the transmission to leak out fluid all over you. <laughs> so make sure you got dirty clothes on too. All right, this is your, uh, your automatic dust plate for the transmission. As soon as you remove your gussets, which go through these four butt holes right here, it'll fall out. Make sure you remove those before you go pulling the transmission off or anything. All right, on your uh, automatic flywheel, you have your torque converter on the front. You got four 14 millimeter bolts you need to remove to remove the torque converter off the flywheel. You need to get the bottom one and then turn the motor over with the crank. It's a 27 millimeter bolt on the crank pulley that you need to spin over and get those four broke, broke loose and take off. All right, spin it over for the last one. All right, when you're moving your last bolt on the, on the torque converter, this thing's gonna weigh probably about 15, 20 pounds. So hold the torque converter while you're moving the last bolt because you don't want that thing falling down in this pan of transmission fluid and splash all over it. That shit stinks. As soon as you get the last one off, just kind of wiggle it off a little bit. Ah, that's it, it's off. Let it drain. Turn it upside down and let it drain out as much as it's going to. Just keep sloshing it around. When you're breaking loose your flywheel and you don't have air tools or anything, you got uh, to take you uh, one of your transmission nuts and well, bolts and screw it back in and take you another nut and a bolt and bolt right here and run you a chain on there so when you go to wrench down on it it won't spin on you it'll stay in place so you can break it loose but me i'm going to use an impact wrench on it to break it loose but you got a they're 19 millimeter and they're 112 foot pounds torqued down so it's pretty tight so when you go to break it loose you want to use a breaker bar or whatever you need but that chain method's pretty cool i read about that on the internet it's a pretty cool idea Good going, Reed.
Alright, uh, when you got your uh, flywheel and all that stuff off, just pour your, your dustpan off. It's just connected on these nipples right here. It's been on there so long. It's probably just kind of rested on there a little bit. Just a little bit of coaxing and it'll come off. Just pry it out of there. You got another little nipple down there. It holds on. You will not use this on your 5-speed. The 5-speed dust plate is different than this one. Okay, when you're going to remove your AC compressor, uh, I'm going to keep my AC and uh, keep it charged up. So I'm just going to re remove the whole compressor while it's still hooked up. But uh, you have a connector right here you need to disconnect. That one right there. And then you have uh, four 14 millimeter bolts. One right there, one on the other side, and then two on the bottom as well. And as soon as you get those two loose, uh, you'll be able to move the compressor. Be real careful though because it's heavy. I take the, the bottom bolts off first and then take the top unless you have two people working with you. But these two lines right here, these two hard lines, do not disconnect them or loosen them because if you do your Freon will come out and then you have to get the whole system recharged. So you got four 14 millimeter bolts, you need to disconnect this connector and you should be good. Now I got my AC compressor unbolted and the wire and clipped and everything. I took a, some tie straps, strapped around this bolt here where the air box hooks to just went around the whole AC compressor and pulled it up out of the way and strapped it up really the only thing you gotta watch out for is uh, when you're pulling your motor out the motor mount is going to hit it so make sure you keep an eye on that as well as the power steering lines when you're pulling the motor but what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove my motor mount where it hooks the bracket that hooks to the block itself with the motor mount I'm going to remove this whole piece right here when I get it up off the, off the frame rail down there just so I have more clearance to get away from the AC compressor. Go ahead and remove your motor mount nuts. The driver's side where you need to hook the chains up to their uh, 12 millimeter nuts. You need to get some uh, pretty thick washers or get, you know, three or four thin washers to hook on there. You don't don't want it to break when you get it up off the car. All right, this side here is a uh, 14 millimeter nuts. You got two on here. You need to run the chains through both. I mean, the bolts through both chains on this side. But watch out! I got some pretty long bolts on here. It's not. You actually need some shorter bolts than that if you can get them. All right, on your harness, you need to get it out of the way. However, you want to do it. Mine have a few things connected. I didn't want to disconnect, so I just put everything up here behind the windshield wiper. Also, you got your Fuel lines you need to keep out of the way. You got your transmission harness down there with the starter and the alternator wire you need to keep out of the way. You got your two heater hoses down there you need to keep out of the way when you're pulling the motor. All right, these power steering lines right here are the ones you do, you do not want to hit when you're pulling the transmission out with the motor. So keep an eye on those as well as everything else when you're pulling everything out.
You have to line the crankshaft pulley up with a small keyway in this picture here on the crankshaft. You don't need to put any liquid gasket on the bottom of the plate because when you go to install your oil pan, it'll have liquid gasket on it and it gets it from there. You have to cut off the oil pan gasket just like you did on the rear main seal gasket. Alright, next you're going to want to take your valve cover off and replace your valve cover gasket. If you unbolt all the bolts, you just pick it up, pull it off. The inside stayed on, the outside didn't. It's alright. Just go ahead and peel it off. Some people put liquid gasket on it, some people don't. Make sure you get all the gasket off there. Alright. Next, as far as the valve cover gasket. You don't necessarily have to put no RTV or sealant or anything liquid gasket along the rails. I just like to put it on these little valleys right here just to make sure it don't leak there. The rest of it should be just fine. Next you want to put on your valve cover gasket on the spark plug holes. Just press down in there. You don't really need no liquid gasket in there neither. And if it leaks later, it's easy to pull off and fix if you have to. And then put your gasket just goes down in these little channels right here, which is another reason it'll usually seal real good. Next you want to put your valve cover on, make sure you get these little round gaskets back here in the slots, make sure they don't flip over or overlap or anything. All right, when you're going to remove your automatic pilot bushing, you got to set up your pilot bushing removal tool. It actually goes through the hole and sprawls out to grab a hold of the inside of it and pulls it out.
All right, after you got your bushing out, you need to take some uh, sandpaper and sand the, hole, the rust and all that crap out of the hole. I'm using 1,000 grit. You could probably use 800 grit, it'd be better, but just round it around your finger and stick it in the hole. And just twist it. Just get all that rust and nastiness out so the, pile, the manual pile of bushing will go in there a whole lot easier. Okay, when I went to install my uh, pilot bushing, I used a 12 millimeter socket to knock it in. I do not recommend that because I just did it and it pretty much tore it all up and, and warped it so even the uh, alignment tool wouldn't go inside it. So I tried to pull it out and couldn't get pulled out so I used a screwdriver and a hammer and chiseled it through to the broken half. But be careful because it don't gouge out the inside of your wall if you, if you go that route. Just go real slow with it and, and make sure you get it out without tearing it up. But my next Next one I put in, I used a piece of wood. I cut it in about half. It's probably about a probably about half an inch. And you just you start knocking it in so it's not gonna mess it up at all. And after you get it so far, it's gonna start chopping the wood off on the edge and going inside the hole and it's not gonna work anymore. So I took an old alignment tool I had and inserted it in there and, and knocked it the rest of the way in. That worked really well actually. That probably the best bet is get you an old alignment tool and Knock it in with that. Possibly start off with a with a board. Like I said before, make sure you get the pilot bushing going in straight to start with, and then knock it all the way in. It has a a little groove on the front right here. It kind of goes bevels back a little bit, so just make sure you got it back that far. You can also stick your finger in there, but it's it's kind of hard to feel it. But you got probably about that much more room before you hit the back wall. But it's not going to go that far because there's a little indention on the inside of the hole about halfway so it, it won't go past that so as soon as you get back as far as you can get it you'll know because it won't go back any further and it's right on the edge of that bevel too so okay i'm gonna zoom in on this and show you the bevel i was talking about up close so you have a better idea of what it looks like okay the pilot bushing is the, the copper looking thing on the inside there and this wall right here is where your automatic bushing was on the inside of and there is a little bevel right there on the edge where it just touches to you. So you should be able to, when you get yours in, you'll you'll see, just get as close as you can to mine. And that's as far back as you need to go. While you're knocking your pilot bushing in, if you use your tool or not, just keep a check on it and keep making sure that your alignment tool will go inside there. Because if your alignment tool won't get, go inside the pilot bushing, then your shaft on your transmission is definitely not going to go in there. Just keep a check on that. And if you end up messing it up, you could take a Dremel and try and smooth it out on the inside, but more than likely you're going to have to put another pilot bushing in there. So I would recommend at least having two pilot bushings just in case. When you go to install your dust plate, make sure the punch out's on this side. You'll know it because your uh, starter hole will be on this side. You have a, a nipple here and here that it goes on. Don't forget to install Loctite on your uh, flywheel and clutch pressure plate bolts just to secure them, make sure they don't come off. When you go to install your flywheel, I'm using the Fidanza lightweight flywheel. There's a little hole on it right here, which on your uh, crankshaft, you have a, there's a hole right here between where the bolts go. And there's usually a little nipple on there, like on the five speeds, the automatic one I guess don't have one. But I, I haven't yet to hear of anybody needing to, needing to get one and find one and put it in. But uh, you need to line this hole up with this hole here. That's how you know you got it on there straight. Make sure you get all the metal shavings off of it. If they didn't get them off, might have had a few on there. And any uh, any kind of bolt or nut that has a torque setting, you need to put motor oil on the threads of it so it'll torque up properly. Good, install your two bolts on there.
You gotta get the flywheel to sit all the way back. When you go to install these, keep tightening them crisscross pattern because you want it to go down flat you don't want to go on sideways so just get it till it hits the very back of it and then you'll be ready to install the rest of them on there and torque it down the torque on all of them is 112 foot pounds and I'll show you a way to hold your uh, hold it down so it don't spin okay when you're going to torque down your flywheel as you can see I got the chain from the engine lift the XS hanging over. I used a uh, one of your bell housing bolts. Just run it back through and put a washer on it, and then run one of your uh, your clutch pressure plate bolts through the flywheel with the washer on it. But you want to torque them all down to 112 foot pounds, and that chain right there is going to hold it still, so it don't move anywhere. Do it in a crisscross pattern. Do not forget your dust plate before you put the flywheel on, or you're gonna have to pull the flywheel back off. After you got them all torqued down, go back and check over all of them, make sure they're all torqued. All your flywheel bolts are 19 millimeter. And the next will be your uh, clutch and pressure plate. Your uh, Pressure plate bolts are 12 millimeter. Okay, when you're going to uh, install your clutch, this is your clutch disc right here. You have uh, two sides to it. This side here sticks out, where this side here does not. So the, the flatter side is the side that goes towards the flywheel. Like the flywheel will be back on this side. So all you need to do is take just a little bit of grease and get it inside the inside the shaft here it don't take too much just a little bit just make sure you get it all the way around because if you get too much grease in there it'll start oozing out and if it gets on the clutch facing it could cause your clutch to slip all right now we're going to take our clutch alignment tool gonna insert it inside the clutch just like that just slide it through there and this end right here, remember when you was installing your pilot bush, and this end right here goes inside the pilot bush. And Next on your flywheel, after you got your plate, pressure plate in, comes these little dowels that go into uh, the holes here, the holes with no screws in it. You have a, uh, there's a little edge on this side and there's a bigger edge on this side. The bigger edge goes in, inside the flywheel this is your pressure plate right here. All you got to do is find the holes. There's a, there's a few of them that can go in, but I just I put a put one right here, right here, and right here, all on opposite ends. There's no real certain way for a clutch to go on. It'll pretty much only go on one way. Just get them lined up with those dowels. It's a little tough to get them lined up if your pressure plate ain't completely flush and flat. Okay, when you're going to install your pressure plate, like I showed you before, you had the nipples. Just keep spinning your uh, pressure plate over until you get the nipples to line up. There's only one way it'll line up. Uh, really, the reason they do that is because they, they probably use the pressure plates for various cars, so they have different hole, hole settings for them and everything. But you want to. Uh, when you get it on there, you'll probably get two on and one won't want to go on exactly, it won't want to pop in. So what I did, I started, you know, two bolts to hold it on and then put two more on. And uh, after I got all my bolts on and got it on a little bit, I started to tighten it down a little bit. And when you go to tighten it down and also to torque it down, you want to do it in a uh, crisscross type pattern. Like say you start here, this will be one, you'll skip one to number two. You'll skip another one to number three, then you'll skip over two to number four, then you'll skip over one more to five, 
Then you'll skip over two more. We have one more, the six. And that's the, the Titan sequence you want to go. And when you get it snug down, you want to torque the you want to torque it down in two settings. First time you want to hit them at uh, 14 foot pounds, and then after you get them all tightened up in that numeric order I showed you, then go back around and tighten them all up to 22 foot pounds. And that'll be your final torque setting on there. And when you get down with that, you can pull your your uh, alignment tool out, and your clutch and style will be and clutch and flywheel and style will be finished. This is another way from keeping the motor from spinning over when you can't use the chain method. I still have my engine on lift, so what I did was I put a ratchet on a, this breaker bar I have here. It's just a pipe hooked it uh, to the crank bolt there and then just release the motor down until it hit right at the ground where that thing goes up. And the bar sits right underneath the bar of the, the lift right here. So then after I did that, I could come over here and torque my clutch bolts down and the bar would lift up I and mean, it wouldn't wouldn't let it spin anymore. And that, that's a good way to do it. And after you get all that done, you can pull the alignment tool out and take you some uh if you didn't do it before, take you a little bit of grease and put inside the pilot bushing, inside the hole there. Because that's where your shaft's going in for your uh transmission. Or you can just put it on the end transmission, either one. Just don't put a whole lot on there because it'll ooze out and get all over clutch and that'd be make your clutch slip. So okay, we have your uh, S14 brake pedals here. The one on the left is the uh, automatic, and the one in the middle and the one on the right are for five speeds. But as you can see, the one on the right is missing a sensor on the right hand side as well as the plastic and the metal bracket on the pedal itself. That's because that one come from a S14 with no cruise control from the factory, where the one in the middle did and the automatic did as well. So if you get a brake pedal without the cruise control things on it, then you're not gonna be able to use cruise control. You need to find one that's got that on there. A lot of people overlook that and don't even tell you anything about that, but. Like I say, I learned the hard way, so that's what I'm here for is to help you out. Okay, we have the S14 clutch pedal here. Make sure when you get your clutch pedal, it has the uh, sensor on it with the pigtail on it, the connector with the pigtail on it, because if you don't have the connector with the pigtail on it, you're not going to be able to wire it up. So that's definitely something to watch out for when you're going to buy used pedals and stuff. That Make sure it has all the sensors and everything. Of course, you can buy them from Nissan or something, but... They're really expensive if you buy them from Nissan. Also, next thing, uh, since your car was automatic, didn't have a clutch pedal before, take your uh, bolt that bolts in that hole right there on your uh, automatic brake pedal when you pulled it out. Take that to a parts store and get it. Get you another bolt and washer mashed up, matched up so you can uh, bolt your uh, clutch pedal down to the up underneath the dash. On the back of the clutch pedal, you have a uh, another sensor here. Which we're not going to use that because on the uh, the factory five-speed cars, that's where uh, you press the clutch pedal in to get the car to start. Where the automatics, they're not wired up for those, so you're not going to be able to do that. So you don't need that. You don't need that sensor at all. Now on your clutch pedal, uh, if you did like I did and uh, you bought a clutch pedal with no no master cylinder on it, you bought a new master cylinder. You need to make sure that you get a. Uh, the nuts for it that bolt the master cylinder to the clutch pedal itself through the firewall or just take it take it to the uh, parts store and match them up you also need to make sure you get the uh, the pin that hooks the master cylinder to the pedal itself right there that pin and the carter pin you see there because you have to have those to hook those on if you can't find one anywhere you could probably use like a bolt and a nut a locking nut or something like that. If you use a S13 clutch pedal and an S14 or vice versa, uh, really the S13 clutch pedal and an S14, it'll sit a little bit crooked, like towards the passenger side, and uh, your rod will kind of like want to bottom out too. So you kind of you need to use a couple washers where it hooks to the where it goes through the firewall to the master cylinder, 
so it'll pull the pedal back some back towards the driver and then uh, if it's sitting a little crooked then put a washer on whichever side you need to straighten it up a little bit and then S13 on the S14 might sit a little crooked but as far as the bringing it towards the driver you don't need to do that it'll be alright on that just clarify that you can use the S13 and the S14 and the S14 and S13 clutch pedals okay if you're going to remove your brake booster and put a 5 speed brake booster in like I'm going to do you need to drain off fluid out of the Phillips head screw right there this connector right here needs to be disconnected you have two 12 millimeter bolts you need to remove well nuts you got one right there and another on the other side to remove that bracket well it actually removes the the master cylinder from the brake booster and the bracket and everything too and then you have the stuff inside that you need to remove because I'm going to remove my brake pedal too and put a 5 speed brake pedal on then you'll also have to disconnect all the hard lines most of them's uh 10 to 12 millimeter you got two on top there the one on the bottom there so you have all those disconnected uh, it's going to bring the whole brake booster assembly is going to go back about an inch so you're going to have to reroute your hard lines you can probably just bend them a little bit but try your best to not kink them if you put a kink in them then the fluid's not going to go through as you can see you don't have much room to work around in there your best bet is to take your uh, brake pedal out and then do your drill your clutch holes and all that stuff so your brake pedal is not in the way and get everything ready and then install your brake pedal first and then your clutch pedal okay here up under the dash you see the gold bolt right there that's uh, one you need to remove to remove your brake pedal it's right above where the connectors are on the brake pedal right there's where it connects to the master cylinder has a quarter pin on it that runs through a a little pin in there you need to remove you can't really see it you just kind of have to stick your hand in there and feel it you need to use like a really small like flathead screwdriver to pull that out and then you have the you can see one right there. there's four bolts that bolt it to the through the firewall to the brake booster you need to remove those four bolts as well and also you need to disconnect both of these connectors here so you can pull the whole pedal out you're going to go pull your booster off of, move all your hard lines off your master cylinder, move the two 12 millimeter nuts off of it from the master cylinder to the brake booster, and then uh, you got to work, work it off. You got the four screws that go through the firewall here, and uh, it's hitting right here and on the hose here. So just, you're going to have to work your way off and, until it comes off, but it will come off. Okay, when you were disconnecting the automatic brake pedal to the master cylinder, it had this uh, carter pin going through the edge of this stud right here. And after you remove the carter pin, it still had this little plastic piece on the end of it. Uh, basically, all you need to do is uh, pop it out a little bit and take a flathead screwdriver and just pop it off till that plastic pops off the edge of it. It's, uh, it's in a very tight place, so you got to fill up there, but okay after you have the brake pedal all disconnected from everything you're ready to pull it out as you'll be able to see it uh it gets caught on the plate right here for the for the steering shaft and also you have this little uh ecu looking box over here you need to remove the harness from it right there and there's it's a 10 million nut and then you have two 10 million nuts one right there and one above it to remove that disconnect it from there and there every bolt on here was a uh, for the brake pedal was a 12 millimeter okay after you have everything unbolted on the brake pedal um, it won't come out because the sensors here that screw in right here are in the way this uh, green ones on the driver side and this blue one was in the passenger side just keep those track just uh you got 14 millimeter nuts here that you need to just loosen and then grab the sensor itself and screw it out after you get those out then you take the pedal and you press press the pedal down all the way like that. Of course, you're going to be you're only going to be able to do it with one hand. After you got it pressed in all the way, then you just kind of kind of bring it out like that. 
it's going to take a little, a little bit of maneuvering to do, but you can do it. After you remove the brake pedal and everything, if you're going to remove it, and you remove that box there, you can pull the piece of carpet out, and you'll see right there it has indentions already to drill the holes for the clutch master cylinder. Okay, when I went to drill my holes for my my clutch pedal and master cylinder, I started off with a, a 732 drill bit just to start off with a smaller pilot hole. Then I went from that to a 1132 inch drill bit, which was my final drill bit on the the bolts that go through the clutch pedal through the firewall to the master to the uh, master cylinder. And then the hole that you cut, I cut an inch and a half. I used a hole saw for it. And I used the inch and a half for that. And also you're going to need a right angle drill to get up in the tight spot there. Because by the time you get everything put on there, you know, it's not much room if you use a normal drill. So you have to either get a, a right angle drill attachment or, you know, borrow one of your, one of your buddies or something or buy one yourself. I think I paid like 130 bucks for that one. Works really well. As you can see now, I have my holes all drilled out. You got the two bolt holes and then the big one in the middle. I need to take a Dremel to it and smooth it out a little bit around the edges, but it's no big deal. And also, if you notice where the punch outs are, I didn't drill it completely all the way out as far as the punches. But you want to try and get, uh, as you can see, my drill holes on the top and the bottom, they're kind of down versus being in the center because I missed my first hole, so you want to make sure you get them real close. You can, I mean, you can definitely drill out the whole hole. You're just going to have a, a little bit of a crack. Okay, to show you on the, the engine bay side of the holes, you can see where, where you got to get to. You got the one up top there along the bottom and the one in the middle. And as you can see, there's not much room in the engine bay to get anything in there drilled out. So your best bet is to drill it from underneath the dash. Okay, I'm going to show you this out of the car because in the car it's so tight on a dash and dark it's hard to see. But basically uh, when you go to put your brake pedal in, your uh, 5 speed brake pedal, this is the automatic but I'm just showing you for reference. Go ahead and pull your sensors out. Go ahead and pull them out, just loosen them up and then hand screw the sensor out itself. And after you have both of those out, you're going to need to take the pedal and push it all, push it all the way down. So when you go to put it in, under the dash, it's gonna it's gonna want to hit a lot of things like the the steering rack and all that stuff. I mean not the steering shaft, not the rack. But you basically need to, you know, it has to, it's gonna have to go up in there like that. This plate right here is gonna want to hit and stuff like that. So believe me, it will fit. It's just it takes a lot of working to get it up in there. But that's all you gotta do is just kind of scoop it up in there like that, and then it'll sit in there. Then after you get it up in there, take this bolt. There's a bolt that goes through here. And hooks up to the bottom of the dash. Go ahead and hook that in and line your holes up with the holes in the firewall for the, the brake booster studs. And after you have that sitting up in there, you'll need to uh, take your uh, your brake booster, uh, your master cylinder for the clutch too works the same way. You have another uh, 14 millimeter nut on this you need to loosen up, which will make this bracket spin. Because you need to get this bracket hooked up with the pedal here. So you can run your shaft through the holes and put your uh, quarter pin in. But you'll bring your your uh, you'll bring your master cylinder or your brake booster in, get it lined up, either tighten it up or loosen it up however far you need to move to get it worked in there. Then after you have that in, tighten up your 14 millimeter nut. On your uh, brake booster though, it's going to be kind of difficult because your hard lines are going to want to hold your brake booster in and things like that. Just I mean, you got to work with it because it's kind of hard to get it in there to begin with, with the with the hard lines in your way and everything the way they're running, and it's also hard to pull it back out because you'll probably have to do it at least at least two times to get this where it needs to be. And then uh, after you get that in, make sure you got all your night uh, your 14 millimeter nuts tightened down and you got everything where it needs to be. Just get and screw your uh, sensors back in your pedal when you get done, and uh, basically how they work, you screw them in by hand, and that 14 millimeter bolt locks them down. Just uh, screw them in until they hit the little plastic piece on the pedal. 
where it's all the way released and it smashes the little button down and that's that's how you set them when you get them where you want to be then just tighten your nuts down as far as the clutch pedal goes it's basically the same deal except rather than having to twist it all up in there it'll just go right up in there you can just stick it up in there and uh on the clutch pedal you have the the studs are on the pedal itself rather than on the master cylinder so you basically do it sort of the same deal again put it in and run your bolt through the top here where it goes into the dash and get it lined up now i have my five speed brake booster in but you can see how far off the hard lines are you got a, a good inch especially on this one and then the one on the bottom here I mean they are bendable so you, you're gonna be able to bend them and get them into place and everything so I wouldn't worry so much about that but just uh, when you go to bend them just bend them real slow by hand and make sure you don't kink them up also one thing to check on this hard line right here goes up underneath this hose here so you're going to have to remove the hose and put it up underneath it best thing to do is remove the bottom hose down there rather than the top one because it has a check valve on it right here it's going to keep wanting to pull out rather than pulling loose of here okay now you can see i got my hard lines run and uh screw down the one on top the first one right there it was didn't give me trouble at all it just bent back a little bit i just bent it back a little bit right here and it went right in the one on the bottom down here didn't have no trouble with it because it goes up top and i just kind of I pushed it back that way and it went in easily. But this one right here is the one that gave me a lot of trouble. As you can see, I had to do a pretty good bend on that. I still might have to work on it when I get the motor in. It might might be in the way of something, but probably not. And this is the one that runs up top there. I had to pull it off a little bit there too. Also, after you get installed, don't forget to put your hook your connector back in on the side. And also, you had a a paper gasket on the back side of the brake booster. If you're new and didn't come with one, uh, use the one off your automatic. Work just fine. Now I have my, uh, my five-speed brake pedal installed. You have to put your uh, your pedal up there first and uh, bolt it up to the top underneath, underneath the dash, and then uh, then bring your brake booster in. And make sure it's lined up the rods lined up with the pedal and uh, put your pin in there in between the pedal and the rod and get that lined up because you have to pull your brake, brake booster out and put it back in a few times to get that get that right and then uh, bolt that nut down and everything for the rod and the uh, put your car pin in your pin through the brake pedal and then uh, take your 12 millimeter bolts the four of them on that that go through the firewall to hold the brake booster and the pedal together through the firewall and then tighten all them down okay now you can see i have my clutch pedal installed too um it's basically the same deal as the uh brake pedal it's nowhere near as difficult as the brake pedal was though because it'll just go right up in there and uh the same thing with your uh where your uh master cylinder goes to the brake pedal you need to adjust the the screw on it where uh the pin goes through and your car pin hooks to adjust that to wherever you want it to be and make sure it needs to it has enough to press the clutch in the master cylinder all the way in so you'll be able to fully depress your clutch pedal and also get all your sensors adjust all your sensors to where uh the pedal comes fully down it it pushes the button in all the way on the clutch and the brake pedal and then tighten everything down you have a uh, two nuts on the outside of the firewall for the clutch master cylinder whereas the brake pedal had it on the four four on the inside and you also have the bolt up top that bolts up to the the dash part of it too that you need to bolt up and tighten up basically what i did is i put the pedal in uh started the bolt up top up top of the dash to hold it there and then brought the master cylinder in and adjusted it to where it needed to be with the screw there and then kept pulling that out till I got it right and tightened all that down. And here in the engine bay, you have the master cylinder. The uh, the top nut up here, it's going to be really hard to get to. You really need to use like a, a swivel on your ratchet, a swivel adapter, 
so you can get it on there and it's still even though you're using the swivel it's still gonna be hard to get on there because you're gonna have to use a deep well socket because the bolt sticks out too far uh, just like this one right here and uh I mean just get it get it snug and tight you ain't got to torque it down or anything just make sure it ain't moving or anything like that and I have my adapter on right here I already put some Teflon tape on it and, and tighten it down for my uh because I'm gonna be running a steel braided line all the way from the master cylinder to the slave cylinder on the transmission rather than running hard lines on that. My steel braid line runs all the way behind the brake booster there into the master cylinder right there. It's real simple to install. You need to, if you use it, you need to install it on the slave cylinder first because this fitting right here is, has the movable fitting on it where the one on the slave cylinder doesn't. So you're not going to be able to hook it up that way. You have to do the slave cylinder first and then come up to the master cylinder and tighten it down. When you go to install your slave cylinder on the transmission, you got two 14 millimeter bolts there. You need to torque them down to 30 foot pounds. If you replace your brake booster like I did, there is a bleeder screw right there. You need to uh, bleed that first. You need to loosen that up, pump the brake pedal a couple times to get some pedal pressure, uh, lock that down, and then uh, start with your right rear tire then do your left rear tire and then do your right front tire and then your left front tire basically what you want to do is you want to start with whichever uh, caliber is furthest away from the master cylinder and then on your uh, clutch pedal if you did like I did and run a, a straight line from the master cylinder to the slave cylinder down below you only take about two or three bleeds but basically what you do is uh, you open up the bleeder on the slave cylinder pump the clutch pedal by hand a couple times to get pedal pressure lock the bleeder screw down of course it's going to take two people to do this because one person it's almost impossible for one person to do it uh, after you got that locked down you got a little bit of pedal pressure uh, pump the pedal about five six times hold it to the floor release the bleed screw on the slave cylinder let it bleed then tighten it up and pump the pedal again about five six times hold it to the floor uh, open up the bleeder on the slave cylinder you just keep doing that basically until you get really good pedal pressure and there is no bubbles coming out of your uh, clear hose. You need to use the clear hose on that too, I might add. Just uh, connect it to the bleeder on the slave cylinder so you can see all the fluid coming out. You can make sure you ain't got no bubbles coming out. And do the same thing with the, the brake system too. Hook the clear hose up on the caliber's bleeder screws and then you should, you should be good to go. Okay, when you're going to wire up your pedals and do all your wiring and stuff, uh, you can either use the butt splice connectors, which is basically this thing right here in the front. You just crimp it down on both sides of the wire. Uh, a lot of people use it. I don't particularly like them that much myself. I'd really solder it. Then you also have the two above there, which uh, crimp down on each other on the wires, and then they connect each other so you can disconnect them later if you need to. And then you have the, the eye crimps there, which basically are good for your grounds to bolt down to a, a bolt or whatever they crimp down just the same way but if you're going to go the soldering method you need some uh, soldering flux which you can get at plumbing section anywhere what I'm using is Dutch Boy tinning flux basically you put it on the wire it gives the, the wire a good solder on it then just use like a regular 25 watt pin soldering iron works well electrical tape whatever color you're using a cigarette lighter you need some uh, heat, heat shrink wrap so you can cover up your solder after you get done and wrap it. And then a good pair of uh, wire cutters and snips. I like the Crafts, Craftsman Professional series. You don't really need anything bigger than that for the jobs we're doing. And as far as the solder I'm using, I just got some from Radio Shack. It's just a .032 die. It's just for light duty. Okay, what you want to do to start out with is uh, wherever the wire is, you want to take it and take it and cut it. This is a 16 gauge wire. Just get a little, a little bit right there. It's not much at all. Splice off both ends of your wire that you're going to be soldering together. Just get you the, you know, just a little bit cut off right there about that length. And take it and uh, do all this while your uh, heat, I mean your uh, soldering iron is getting hot. While it's cut on, just dip it in the, in the flux. Get a little bit on it. 
And then go ahead and um, take your soldering iron, get some solder on it. The soldering iron here is about had it, but to get some solder on it, put some solder on the tips here. Tips of the wires you just cut off and put flux on. And then after you get them done, go ahead and get your wires ready to hook together. I'm gonna get some more solder on your on your gun. Just touch the two together. And after you have that soldered on, if you, uh, like I have right now, I have a piece that's already cut on both sides, of course, but don't forget to put your uh, heat shrink wrap on the wire before you solder it together, because you probably won't be able to do it on the other ends, of course. And put it on there, take a cigarette lighter, and just burn it on. And that's it, the wire's ready to go. It's strong, it's not gonna come loose. I'm pulling it with a pretty good bit of force right now and it's not coming loose at all. So you'll be good to go on that. That's why I like it better than the butt splice connectors because butt splice connectors, you got to pretty much, it'll wear your hand out doing a lot of if you got a lot to do. And plus it, I don't really think it's as strong. Okay, you can see I have my sensors wired up now. This one right here is uh, your clutch pedal sensor. It's a green sensor, has a green tip on it with a blue plug, connector plug. And then here on your brake pedal, you have a green sensor with a blue connector plug. Just like the clutch pedal, but it's on the brake pedal. And then over here, you have the uh, blue connector. Well, the blue sensor with the gray connector. But this one on this side, you're not going to mess with anything on it. It's just this one and the one on the clutch pedal here. To show you that. And uh, I'm going to show you how to wire it up outside the car. Okay, when you're going to wire up your uh, clutch pedal, Basically, this is the way it's set up. You have your brake pedal. It has two sensors on it. This sensor here is a, a green sensor with a blue connector with pigtails on it. This one's a, a blue sensor with a gray connector with pigtails on it. And your clutch uh, pedal sensor is a green sensor with a blue connector with pigtails on it. That's what those stand for. And on uh, your brake pedal, you have a, a green and red wire. A green wire with a red stripe on it. On this, on this side, which uh, it all depends on which way your sensor was turned, so that's why I'm giving you the colors. The one that's green with the red stripe on it, on the brake sensor, on the left hand side, you don't cut that one, you don't mess with that one at all. The one on the left hand side is a uh, green with a black line on it, that's the one you cut. It actually runs from the sensor to the harness, you cut it, so you'll have the pigtail hanging off the sensor, you'll have the pigtail off the, hand, off the harness. That's basically how that works. And over here on your clutch pedal, you have a, a green wire with a white line on it, and then you have a green wire with a black line on it. So basically all you gotta do to wire that up, you take the, uh, the green and black wire that you cut on the sensor, the pigtail's hanging off the sensor, not the harness, but the sensor. You bring it over here and tie it into the green and white wire on your uh, clutch pedal sensor. And then, this is your uh, pigtail hanging off your harness that you cut off the green and black wire. You uh, bring the green and black wire off your clutch pedal and hook it into the harness. So basically all that's doing is looping the clutch pedal into that line, that, what that harness was before. It just basically loops it in there. And that's how that works. And uh, as far as your cruise control goes, that's all you have to do. You don't have to wire up, wire up anything extra for the cruise control. Cruise control will still work as long as you have your sensor for it. That's basically what this sensor right here is for, is your cruise control. And also, uh, the little ECU looking box that sits beside where the clutch pedal is called the auto control unit. You do not have to install it anymore. Just uh, put the 5 speed ECU in and remove that box completely and just tie up the cables and the connectors and stuff for it to keep it out of the way or you can cut them off whatever you want to do okay here under the dash you have the your connector for your uh, clutch pedal the uh, green and white wire on the connector there runs over I'm using a black wire running through 
it runs over to the brake pedal connector there on the driver's side and it runs into the green and black wire and then the other wire on that connector stays hooked up to the harness on it and then also over on the clutch connector you have the the green and black wire off run off that I have a red wire running off of it and it goes up to and connects to the harness where the uh, brake connector you, you that's where you split it so basically all it does is it just loops it loops this connector in in line with that from where you cut the wire off the the brake connector and the harness it just basically loops that connector through and just, so that's how that works and also you can see down here I've got my uh, harness for my automatic control unit I just got it tie strapped up here tie strapped to the uh, hood release cord just to keep it out of the way so it don't fall down All right, when you're going to uh, wire up your, your plugs back here behind the fuse box, the top one here is the revolution sensor. All you got to do is cut it off and just uh, jumper it together. Pretty much what I did is I cut it off and soldered it and put a heat shrink on it. And that's all you got to do on that one. That's so the, uh, the car will think it's in part so it'll start. All right, when you're going to wire up your third connector down, your inhibitor switch, if you look at the F FSM, the second one and third one is called the inhibitor switch but you're not going to be using the second one, so we're going with the third one. You have all the wires that come off of it. The only ones you're going to use off of it is the green one and the black one. The rest of them you can cut off. And that will run all the way down to the uh, reverse lap switch connector on the five-speed transmission. It don't matter which wire goes to which wire because it, it just completes the circuit. So it don't matter because on the, on the connector here, they're both the same color anyway, so you're not going to be able to tell the difference. And then you got about this much length to get back to the transmission. Just give yourself a little bit of leeway so you don't want it too tight. And after you get it all uh, soldered up and heat shrinked, and uh, take some electrical tape all around it just to keep it covered up and also put some wire loom on it too to keep because it's going to be running down through the engine bay. It's going to get hot. When you're going to wire up your uh, five-speed transmission, you need to get a five-speed transmission harness or just hard wire them. Because if you, if you don't get the five-speed uh, harness, then you won't get the connectors. Like on the automatic harness, you still get to use the speed sensor connector and the O2 connector, but you got to get the neutral position switch connector. Then you have the fifth position switch, and then you can also use your Craig, Craig Eagle sensor uh, sub-harness connector too. But you don't necessarily have to use the fifth position switch if you don't want to. But, you know, and then you have your uh, reverse light. Actually, this is the fifth position. Fifth position is the reverse light one right here. So if you can't locate the harness, you can uh, just cut the connectors off the transmission itself and just hard wire them in. Or you can just you can wire in some uh, connectors so you can remove it if you need to. It's up to you how you want to do it, really. But I got a harness, so I'm going to do mine. Okay, when you're going to remove your ECU, you have to go under the dash. There's a little screw that goes in that in that bolt right there. It's just a little plastic screw. After you have the screw off, you uh, got to pull your door seal up right here, and then this part here will come off. You can just slide this off, and it exposes your ECU. If you're going to use the auto ECU, you can still leave it in, but I'm going to use a, a five-speed ECU. And when you're going to remove the ECU, you have a 10 millimeter bolt here that screws the harness on. You have another 10 millimeter that screws the bracket on right here. You have another one down here on the bottom. You can't see it right now, but it's right on the bottom. And you also have the other one right here that goes to the screw that plastic nut you took off to take the cover off of there. Well, make sure you uh, move your harness. It's like you just slide a screwdriver down in there. And it slides off that, hooks to that hole there. Just make sure uh, you have the three screws that hooked on and the harness connector there that hooked on. When you're going to check your uh, identifying your ECU, you look at that batch number is there on the bottom left. The one that says A18-EOB G91. And then you'll go to uh, my website where it says identifying ECUs and figure out which ECU you have. If you have ODB1 or ODB2 car, if you're not sure. 
after you have your ECU out, if your new ECU didn't come with the, the holder brackets, just remove the two uh, Phillips head screws on each side before and all, and then you slide the ECU right out and put the new one in. Okay, after you have your ECU out, you want to pull this plastic, plastic pick off, piece off the harness right there. You just put a screwdriver in there and pull the little clips off each side. And basically what you need to do is uh, go through the factory service, your factory service mill for your year and uh, figure out which one's your fifth position sensor and your uh, neutral position sensor and uh, which wires are which. Basically when you're looking at the uh, factory service manual, it'll show it sideways and you have to pretty much, uh, like the harness sits up like that into the ECU, we have right now it's laying down to the side. But uh, just like on the factory service manual, how it's laying down sideways, it's just like that. You just lay the, the harness down and that's the side. That'll be the left side on it, that'll be the right side on it, just like on the picture. If you're using a 95 ODB 2 car, you can uh, do just like I did. And uh, like I say, the, the fifth position is uh, pin number seven, and it's red and black. Which basically, there's no other red and black wire on the harness here. So... Just look at the picture I'm going to provide and you could go off that completely. And the neutral is number 22 pin and it's red and green. Which basically means they're both red wires. The fifth has a black stripe on it and the neutral has a green stripe on it. And there's no other colors like that on there. There's the only two colors of that on the harness itself. So you, you won't be able to get it wrong. What I'm going to do is I've run my wires up through the dash there. And I've... Uh, where they come out at. Basically what I did was I drilled the hole right there and run all four of the wires up from the transmission in front of the shifter hole there and run through the dash. And basically they run all the way around up behind all that stuff there and then run back out through that hole there. And I'm going to connect them to the, the ECU wiring right here. That's my red and green and red and black wire right there. The uh, red and black is your uh, fifth position. And then the red and uh, green is the neutral position. So instead of cutting them at the, at the ECU there, I'm going to run up there so it'll hide it a little better, clean it up. And I'm, I'm soldering all my connections. I'm not using butt splices or anything like that because soldering is a much better way to go. And also, you have a ground connection right here already so just loosen that screw and uh run you a hoop in there and run both your black ground wires from uh your sensors under, on the transmission that's what those are those black wires there for the off the two switches just ground them into that bolt right there down here underneath the car as you can see the transmission right here that's my fifth position switch right there and i got it Running up, this is that's the fifth position switch. This is your five speed uh, speed sensor switch. Your uh, neutral position is on top. You can't really see it right, and it's right here, right there. And then you have the other one running over for the O2 sensor right here. If you're going to use it, really right now the only thing I have I have a a front O2 sensor in here just to plug the hole up until I get it going because you're if you're uh, not using the emissions anymore you don't need this O2 sensor anymore but you need something to plug the hole with or you'll have an exhaust leak but uh, back to the wiring you have the fifth position and the neutral position that you wire it up to go up through the shifter it goes up in front of the the hole I drilled in front of the shifter just want to show you that down underneath the car. Okay, if you're going to be using the auto ECU instead of the 5 speed ECU, uh, don't hook up the fifth position switch because it's a ODB2 uh, diagnostic port on the automatic ECU. And uh, I've heard a few people say it's got some cold start issues or whatever. You know, it still works though, but I recommend using the, the 5 speed ECU because you can get them pretty cheap. So, uh, just to let you know that, don't hook up the fifth position switch if you use the auto ECU. Also, on the ECU, as far as which one to use, like if you're using a S13, 91 to 94, five-speed, uh, you need to use the 91 to 94 ECU 
And the same with the 95, 96 is you need 95, 96. And then 97, 98, you need 97, 98 ECU. You can repaint them if you need to, but uh, since they're so easy to come by, it's easy just a whole lot easier just to get the right ECU that you need. All right, on the S14 ODB2 transmissions, you have the fifth and the neutral position switches that you need to hook up to the ECU. Basically, a fifth position connector has a yellow with a blue stripe wire on it, which goes up to the ECU, which is the number seven pin on the ECU, which is a red wire with a black uh, stripe on it. And then uh, you have your, your black ground wire as well. And then you have your neutral position, which is a green wire with a orange stripe on it, which goes up to the ECU into a number 22 pin, which is a red with a green stripe wire. And showing you here is the S13 transmission. Basically, it's the same deal with that. You need to go through your ECU, I mean your uh, factory service manual, if you're wanting to hook up your sensor there. And when you're going to wire up your, your plugs or whatever, you need to try and keep the color coordinated or keep up with what it is. Like basically, I used a uh, a blue wire from my fifth position to the ECU because it has a blue stripe on it because I couldn't find the yellow wire at the time and then on my neutral it's the green with the orange wire I used the green wire for that to extend them all up to the ECU basically you need to wait until uh, you get the motor and transmission in the car before you go to wire those up because you don't really know exactly how much wire you're going to need so that's the best time to do that just wait till you get it in I'd go ahead and drill a hole into the shifter, right right in front of the shifter before you do that so you don't get no metal shavings in the transmission or no kind of craziness like that. And the same with wiring up the reverse lamp switch too. You need to wait till you get the transmission in to do that so you know exactly how much wire you need to run back there because that's the, the wire that runs behind the fuse box, the green and black wire. And you'll need to extend those. I'd extend those with green and black wire as well. Okay, when you go to install your ECU, take your uh, plastic that's around your uh, harness there, snap it onto the holder there. You have a bolt up there you need to slide it in. You have a bolt here that needs to slide in. You have another bolt on the bottom there. You can't see it. It's behind the harness there on the bottom. We get all those lined up. Go ahead and screw that one in first. Then do the bottom one. And then tighten that one in. And then go ahead and put, hook your harness in. It's a, They're all 10 millimeter nuts. Put your harness in. Tighten it up. Tighten it all the way until it gets snug. Don't don't torque it down. Just snug it down. And that's good. Go ahead and put uh, your carpet back around and everything and put your interior piece on. It just slides on there and then you get the plastic nut that bolts to that bolt back there. Plastic nut will go over that nut there and holds it down.
Okay, you have your uh, S14 transmission on the left hand side, the S13 transmission on the right hand side. Um, really the only difference between the two is the S13 transmission has a top fourth position switch which sits right here right there where your S14 transmission does not have one that's where it would be then you have the uh, reverse lamp switch which sits right below that on each transmission they both have the same one which they both have a overdrive fifth position switch too which sits right there which they both have and then above that you have the neutral position switch which they both have as well and then the S13 speed sensor looks like that and the S14 speed sensor don't have one in they both sit in the same spot but they're different sensors so you cannot use one for the other and uh, as far as the sensors go on the swap you don't necessarily have to have the uh, overdrive position switch and you don't necessarily have to have the top fourth position switch on the S13 transmissions either if you, uh, the transmissions you bought did not come with them you, you don't have to use them then the only other difference between the S13 and the S14 transmissions um, the S14 transmissions the ODB2 models have the, the hole in the top of the bell housing for the crank angle sensors so uh, if you get an S13 transmission really you need to measure it out and drill a hole for it because your car is not going to run without that position switch I mean without the, the crank angle sensor so you're going to have to have that so try your best to get the S14 transmission if you can but if not then it's not that big a deal to have to drill it out and I've never actually done it so I don't know how well it will work out but and then on another note you have your uh, this hose running off the transmission here is the breather hose which my S14 don't have the hose on it right now but I have one for it but basically what it does is it goes from there and runs all up to the top of the bell housing and hooks on to one of the bolts where it bolts onto the motor and it keeps a the hose up over the top so it gets a, a good ventilation and everything you really need to get one of those and, and use that and hook it up properly if you want your transmission to, to last a good time and uh, my S14 transmission don't have the striker arm in it because I bought mine off a guy that did an RB swap and that's another good thing to look out for people that do RB swaps usually take the KA striker arms because they want to go to like a short shifter like a B&M shifter they need that striker arm for it which they only cost about 30 bucks if you buy them brand new somewhere so it's not really that big a deal but just thought that would be a good note to add that's what they look like right there if you put the RB striker arm in the K it sits forward a lot more and it, it won't shift properly also the uh, neither one of these transmissions have the dust collar on the back this one this S13 one has the metal on it but those only cost about 20 25 bucks from dealership too so they're not that big a deal to worry about but that's really the main main thing as far as the difference between the two transmissions of course you can see they they got a little bit different look to them the s14 has you know the lines going on right there where the s13 doesn't which also if you needed to you could swap out bell house the bell housings on either or you know if you had say you had an s14 transmission that you bought in the S13 you know you could just swap out the bell housings instead of you know drilling that hole or whatever for the crank angle sensor but as far as the gearbox and everything like that inside I have yet to find anybody or anything to say that there's any difference on the insides and uh, I believe the SR20 and the RB transmissions will work the same too I'm not sure on the bell housings and things like that but as far as my research goes they seem like they're going to be pretty much the same too you might have to swap out the bell, the bell housings there but the, the gearbox and everything should work just fine also on the transmission it comes with a clutch fork which has a uh, retainer spring which is right there and that's what hooks to the nipple on the transmission which I'll show you later if that's uh, bent or broken or anything you'll have to replace that and it uh, hooks to the uh, 
release sleeve which has a holder spring on it which is this piece right here if you don't have that hooked on properly it's not gonna it's not gonna work right but the release sleeve has a throw out bearing on the other end of it which we'll go through that a little, a little later in the video and replace that and also you have the check spring with a check ball the check ball is not actually attached to the spring I just have it sitting there for now but it, it hooks to the hole in the transmission hooks to the hole in the transmission right there right beside the where the striker arm goes I'll show you this one right there beside the striker arm it sits and goes in that hole you put the ball down first and then the spring and then you uh, bolt your shifter plate on top of that When you're going to move uh, the rear end of your transmission off, uh, make sure you remove your speed sensor if it's connected. Since uh, my shift linkage and stuff was not right, I guess you ever had it before screwed up. It wasn't even shifting the gear when I had it in the car. I should have checked all this out before, but I just figured it'd be okay. When you're going to pull the rear end off the transmission, the gearbox is in the middle here, in between the rear end and the bell housing. What you gotta do is remove all the bolts around and then take a, a scraper and a, and a hammer and break loose all the liquid gasket, RTV, whatever it is, around there. And you have a, a couple dowel pins, nipples. There, there. You have two of them on there. After you get uh, the RTV broke loose, uh, you need to knock them off those nipples right here. You have little striking points here. And here to hit it with a hammer. Don't knock it really hard, just kind of tap it off and just kind of wiggle it back and forth, break it loose off of them, and then pick that thing up. But before you go to take it off, you have to remove your striking arm, which is right here. And then uh, there's a little pin inside here. I'm just using an old screwdriver that broke loose that's, that'll fit in, inside the hole. Then I have a magnetic one stuck behind here so it'll catch the pin when it falls out, when it knocks out the back. So don't fall down the gearbox and all that good stuff. End up losing it. So as soon as you knock this out, you can uh, pick the whole rear end up just a little bit until you got enough to pull the striker arm out. Because you, you have to remove it anyways to get that out because there's not enough room to pull that back to get the striking arm off. Okay, I got the rear end off the transmission. I'm going to show you a few things on here. This hole on this arm right here is where uh, your striking arm went. It's locked on to this rod right here and as you can see this rod goes down to another rod which goes to, through all three of these and as you can see it goes through all three of them which means if it can go through all three of them it's in neutral all three of them is in neutral you have a uh, let's see this one here on this side is first and second gear this one here is for third and fourth gear and this one here is for fifth and reverse gear Now. It's on first gear right now. If I pressed it down, that would be first gear, and pulling it up would be second gear. Same with this one, would be downs third gear, ups fourth gear, downs fifth gear, ups reverse. And uh, you can also, uh, after you're doing that, you can put them in gear, you can spin the input shaft, check it, and make sure it's, you know, it spins freely and everything. So just check it all out, make sure everything's good on that. You can check all your gears out and everything, your bearings, everything looks fine on this one. You have a leftover RTV here, scrape all that off, clean the surface off real real good. And uh, before you go put it all back on, free RTV at all. What you wanna do, you wanna go on the inside the bolt holes everywhere and on the inside of the dowels as well. Then also you have your, uh, your shafts here, they're spring loaded. That's what keeps your uh, shifter from going back and forth. Like uh, I'll show you on here. If it didn't have those uh, spring loaded things, this shifter would be able to pop out like that. And that would not be good. <laughs> if that popped out, you could pull the whole rod out and it'd have all kinds of messes. So before you go put it all together, make sure they're all in the middle. You could probably take one, press it down, or pull it up, and make sure it's in the middle. When it's in the middle and in, in neutral, it'll, it'll wiggle a bit. Won't be as, as stiff. And, uh, just make sure they're all neutral before you put them down. 
or else you'll end up with the same problem I had and you have to pull your old transmission off your, underneath your car and tear it apart just to fix this. So <laughs> just a heads up on that. I would recommend doing this anyways even if you bought it from a reputable person just to make sure that everything's good. Go ahead and reseal it up, reseal the gasket up. Shaft, you have your RTV on here, your uh, liquid gasket on the shaft there. Go ahead and install your uh, rear end on your transmission. Just guide it down through there. Go real slow and take care of everything. Make sure you're not hitting nothing or tearing anything up. After you get it so far down, take your striking arm, go ahead and install it onto the shaft there. And go ahead and let it guide all the way down. And after that, all you gotta do is get them lined up with the dowel pins. And press it down on there. You get put all your bolts on. They're 12 millimeter. Do everything in a crisscross pattern. And you're torquing them down. Then when you have all that done, go ahead and install your uh, your uh, dowel pin into your striking arm. Get that on there. Make sure your holes all lined up and everything. And that's that. Pull the throw, bear, throw out bearing off the fork and it just slides right off. The fork comes off the pivot there. You just pull it out the dust collar. Okay, next we're going to clean up and replace some gaskets and seals on the mantle transmission. It's got all the black stuff inside there from clutch dust and all that leaking rear main seal and stuff like that. I'm going to put a new uh, clutch fork pivot on which goes right there I'm gonna pull the front cover off right there and replace the uh, gasket and the oil seal inside there clean all the stuff up replace the dust boot there replacing the clutch fork and the release sleeve and throw out bearing and retainer spring and all that stuff okay now you got the front cover off you can see inside you got your bearings and stuff right there in the front if you want to swap those out, you can, but I'm not going to. Only I'm going to do here on the front cover, have an oil seal right there. I'm going to pull it out and replace that. And you got to put a new gasket on. I had to scrape all this gasket off and put a new gasket on there. You had five 12 millimeter bolts that held it down. And this uh, clutch fork pivot is uh, 19 millimeter. You need a deep wheel, 19 millimeter to get that off. You can see the three rods there, they're all flush. It'll tell you that they're all in neutral position. If one of them's pushed back or pulled out a little forward or whatever, and you can't get the shifter to move it, then you're going to have to break the rear end apart and do it like I showed you with the rods back there. Pulling your front cover off, there is a metal seal in here, metal ring. Make sure that does not fall out and you don't lose that. Make sure you have it back in there before you install it in the, into the transmission because it, it touches this the bearing lip right here and you need that for when that spins so don't gouge out the inside of the front cover there. And usually you want to inspect it too. If it's scarred up real bad, I'd replace that because that keeps it from tearing up the front cover there. Your uh, five front cover bolt there, bolts there uh, torque down to 14 to 15 foot pounds. And then your uh, fork pivot right there torques down to 25 foot pounds. When you're going to remove your throw-out bearing off your release sleeve, take a 26 millimeter socket, fits right down in the hole. Just uh, put it on a table or whatever. I just got on some uh, deep well sockets right now. And after you get on there, just knock it out with a hammer. And it'll come right out. And then you can go ahead and uh, replace uh, your throw-out bearing. Okay, when you're going to install your throw-out bearing on your release sleeve, this is your release sleeve right here, and this is your throw-out bearing. I just put mine in a vise and put two boards on each side just so it don't damage them. And then just tighten up the vise. It'll go all the way down until they both touch each other. Make sure you get the throw out bearing started on the release sleeve first and get it going straight.
after you get it installed in there, you'll see it's all the way down and pushed all the way into it. And uh, on your throwout bearing, you got a side that spins on it. It's got this little piece on it that spins right here. Make sure that's pointing out and not into this side because this is what touches your pressure plate. This end of the throwout bearing right there. And if you got it backwards, it's not going to work. You have to pull it back off. I'm replacing my rear seal, which goes in right there. You want to cover the whole thing in motor oil. And press it in on the back. You can either use a tool or you can just press it in by hand. But make sure you got it flat all the way around. Which that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to press it in by hand. Just make sure you have it pushed all the way back and it's all flush all the way around. So you or else you'll get a oil leak. Alright, when you're going to grease up your uh, transmission, you need to grease up the nipple right here. And then uh, you need to go up on the shaft. You need to grease, grease up the shaft right here where the, the release sleeve is going to go. And also put a little grease right here on the shaft itself too so uh this right here with the, with the teeth on it that's actually what goes inside the clutch and then the front part right here this is what goes inside the uh your pilot bushing just put a little bit of grease on everything not a whole lot mainly right here is where your uh throw out bearing and your release sleeve is gonna move back and forth so you need some on that and then just a little bit here for the clutch and then a little bit on this here for the pilot bushing and grease up your nipple right here that your fork connects to. Also before you install the your fork uh, right here it's got the little indention on it like on the front it's bumped out but on the inside it's bumped in. That's actually what goes over your, your nipple right there so put a little grease on that too and a little on the uh, spring right here on it so it'll slide over this a whole lot better and gives it a little more lubrication to move back and forth. And also put a little uh, a little bit on the outside right here that's where your, uh, your slave cylinder pushes down on the fork and make it move like that. And also put a little, a little bit on the ends right here where it uh, touches the release sleeve. So I'll get a little, bit of, a little bit of grease on that. And also here on your release sleeve, you want to put a little, little bit on the inside too. Because this is what actually goes on here. And it slides back and forth so you want to make sure you got you know good lubrication on that. Okay, after you have your fork all greased up everywhere, go ahead and take your uh, your dust boot fork, fork, forking through it. Go ahead and install it on the on the transmission. I'm using a brand new one, so mine's a little stiff to get in. You can do it either way. You can install the boot first, and then the fork or however you want to do it. Show you a better picture of uh, how this spring right here goes on the back of the fork. This is the back side of the fork. Make sure that you have the points here pointing outward and then the cuts there going in into the fork. Don't have it backwards. And basically it's going to sit on there like that. So I just want to show you how that worked out. Make sure you get the holder spring on there properly into the release release sleeve here. And then you just flip it around. You just flip it around and slide it onto the fork like that. The fork will just slide right in like that. And after you get it on, push your fork down onto the nipple. Make sure you get it all the way on the shaft and make sure it'll go all the way back. And when you got it back, make sure you uh, give it a couple moves back and forth. Get some grease worked in it and make sure everything's moving properly and smoothly. Because if it goes just a little too far, it's going to pop off that lip and get stuck like that. But that's not that big a deal. Just make sure everything's going real smooth and you got everything greased up good. And make sure you don't touch the front of the throwout bearing that moves and spins on the pressure plate. If you do, wipe it off really good because that'll cause your clutch to slip. Okay, when you're going to install your dust, your uh, dust collar on the back of your transmission, just get started on there. 
it has a little cutout on the bottom right there that goes on the bottom and uh just take your board put it up against it and hammer it on there make sure it's straight all the way around okay on the speed sensors the automatic speed sensors on the left and the five speed speed sensors on the right for the s14 chassis the first thing to look for is a different color wheel the darker wheel is the five speed the lighter color is the automatic the next thing to look for is uh on the five speed if you hold it if you hold the connector straight up the uh the bolt hole for where uh, it bolts to the transmission is on the total opposite side of it that's another way to tell it's also the barrels thinner the whole thing's thinner see how thicker the the barrel is compared to the five speed automatic speed sensor will not go will not fit inside the hole of the five speed transmission and also another thing to look for in the automatic if you look at the connector straight up just like we did the five speed it's on the top side where the five speed will be on the back side so that's the differences between them if you want to install your motor and transmission in the car you need to jack up the front of the car you don't need to jack up a whole lot just you know a couple clicks on your jack stands you can put your uh, jack underneath the car for to guide your transmission under, and then uh, when you're going to raise your motor and transmission up, you need to have it angled back a little bit. And also, all you gotta do is just get your pan where it'll clear the rat the radiator support there, and then you can just pick the back of the transmission up and just pull it in the engine bay. Also, make sure everything's out of your way in your engine bay. Make sure all your harnesses is out of the way and your hoses and everything. Because right here is where your motor mount goes on the passenger side, and that's on the driver's side. Like on mine, I, I left the AC compressor, so if you did like me, leave your uh, driver's side motor mount bracket and motor mount off until you get the motor in there, and you put that on. And be real careful when you're putting it in, and do not tear up the power steering lines there. Okay, when you hit this spot here, really what you need to do, you need to uh, take your leveler and probably pull it out about right here. But since I had somebody helping me, I wasn't worried about it. What you gotta do is you gotta get it, the transmission down in the tunnel, and the tunnel goes downward, so as soon as you get it on there, it'll slide down it. But just uh, keep eyeing everything, make sure you're not hitting no lines anywhere, or any connectors or wires or anything. And that's pretty much all you gotta do. Passenger side motor mount, that's the one you want to start with. When you're bringing your engine down and transmission down, you want to get that one lined up first because your uh, driver's side is not going to be on anyways because the AC compressor. But uh, 
get it to fall down in the hole. And then when it goes through the hole, then uh, put your washer and bolt, uh, washer and bolt on the bottom of the frame rail, and get it tightened up. And then loosen the bottom of it up when you get it on there, so you can get the driver side lined up right. And then when you got your passenger side done and ready to go with the bottom bolt loosened up, you want to bring it down all the way. You probably bring the transmission down a little bit with the jack to get it lined up properly. But uh, get it to fall in the hole too, and do the exact same thing you did on the uh, passenger side, but. Of course, you got to put your brackets on too. Your uh, bracket to the block, and that torques down to 41 foot pounds. And just leave both your bottom bolts a little loose, so when you can uh, move the transmission back and forth, just to get it straightened up. And then we'll go back and torque those up when you get the transmission cross member on. All right, as far as the differences between cross members, we have an automatic S14 cross member. We have a S14 five-speed cross member, and we have an S13 five-speed cross member. All right, the difference between the exhaust tube mounting brackets is this is the S13 five-speed, this is the S14 automatic. The difference between the two is the automatics have the hump on them, as you can see, and the five-speeds are straight. You can use the S13 on the S14 and vice versa. You just cannot use the automatic for the manual. All right, the differences between the S14 automatic and five speed is as you can see the cross member has the cut this way and the cut this way it's almost like it's flipped from one to another but as you can also see it has the bend down on this side so you could not flip it and, and use the manual for the automatic but you can use the mount the automatic for the manual mount or the manual mount for the automatic whatever and the exhaust tube mounting bracket on it you can use those but you cannot use the uh, cross members themselves. Alright on the S13's, this is a S13 5 speed cross member. You can use this, the S13 cross members on the S14's and vice versa. But as you can see the the transmission mount is smaller than the S14. All right, as far as your differences in uh, drive shafts, they're both S14 drive shafts. This is your automatic one. This one's your manual one. As you can see, the automatic is thinner than the manual one. But as far as the back halves, they're the same size, and the center bearings in the same section. So you could actually use the back half of it on the five-speed, but since it's so much thinner, I, I wouldn't do it. But you could if you had to. All right, the differences between the front halves of your uh, drive shafts. This is the automatic. This is the manual. As you can see with the screwdriver, it's that much longer. The automatic's that much longer than the manual. It's a good inch and quarter. The S13 drive shafts on the left and the S14 drive shafts on the right. As you can see, the differences in them. The front shaft is a lot smaller. Which brings the carrier bearing up closer, and the S14 drive shaft is a bit longer as well. On top, go and install your five-speed drive shaft. What you need to do is you need to slide it into the back of the transmission first. It'll only go in one way. There's usually like a a yellow line on, on the drive shaft somewhere that usually goes towards the bottom, because uh, on the drive shaft on the inside of the input. There's like two little notches on the sides, so it'll only go in one way. You can either have it upside down or the other way, but that's only that's the only way it won't go in, but one way. After you get that in, then come back here and put your uh, your support bracket on, so it'll hold this up, and then you can uh, go ahead and put your where it bolts to the propeller shaft. You can put that on, and then uh, go ahead and bolt your center bearing down to the chassis. After that. And then torque everything down. And as far as putting your uh, five-speed transmission mount in, you got the two bolts on the outside, on each side. So you got four of them all in all. You have the two in the middle that go to the mount itself, and then you have the the two up in the holes that goes through the transmission mount to the transmission. That's what those are for. You need to tighten all those down, torque them down. Check your factory service manual on those, see what they are. I use the JGS 
transmission mount, so mine's not torqued to spec. Mine's just torqued about 30 foot pounds on all of them. You want to install your radiator and fan and shroud and all that back in? Like before, just leave the radiator and shroud and all that just as one piece. And uh, put your fan inside there like that because when you go to put it in, you got to slide it down over. Make sure you take your bolts off your pulley because that's what hooks the fan on. Fan goes on and then bolts the pulley down. But bolts down the pulley with them nuts there. And uh, make sure you get your uh, your rubber feet. Make sure your rubber feet's on the bottom of the radiator there because that's what goes down in the holes here. It slides down and uh, make sure your uh, wiring harness is still hanging out the bottom. And uh, it's going to go over here and hook up to this. So just when you're going in, it's just the same as taking it out. Just watch watch your lines. Like I don't have my canister no more or anything like that, so all those lines are gone. So it would probably be pretty fairly simple to go in, except for maybe missing this wire right here, and that's probably the only catch it's going to have, and probably the power steering line here. Just slide it down in there, and uh, get the feet to fall in the hole, and then go ahead and bolt your fan up, and then hook hook your hoses up and everything. Okay, after you got your radiator fan and fan shroud and all that stuff on. Go ahead and uh, bolt your four 10 millimeter nuts on your fan to the water pump. Uh, just want to snug up the bolts and then go ahead and tighten up all your pulleys. I mean, all your all your belts. Uh, 14 millimeter. You have to. This is where you tighten your belt out, and then there's a a nut here on the side too that tightens up this so it don't tightens up this bolt so it don't move. Your alternator here. You can see better that the bolt here and here's the other bolt that locks it down so it don't move and then after you get all, the, all your belts tight you'll be able to tighten down your nuts on your fan because before if you had it loose it, it would just keep wanting to spin on you so since it's tight and got tension on it now you'll be able to tighten it down good okay when you're going to install your manual transmission onto your motor make sure you got all your uh, your shaft lubed up and everything. Make sure you got all your, your grease on it. And uh, basically, all you're doing is you're sticking this in the hole of the clutch through the clutch. This is going through the pilot bushing, and then the one with the teeth on it's the one that's actually going through the clutch. So that's where you're going to have your problem at is getting the teeth in the clutch. So you might have to turn a little bit, pull it back off, and turn a little bit. You know, do a little bit of wrestling with it. It should slide around, but you shouldn't have too much problem with it. Watch your sensor when you're picking it up. Make sure you're not picking up on the sensor or anything. It'll take a couple tries to get it. If your motor's already in the car, and the best thing to do is get the motor to prop back a little bit, so it'll be at an angle, and you can get up underneath the trans, you get up underneath the transmission. Well, you're gonna have to be underneath the transmission anyways, and you can pick it up that way, and slide it on. But when you're out of the car, you want to grab about the middle, midways of the transmission nuts, so you get the weight kind of like balanced out. Once you get it in spot, it's a matter of jiggling onto the nipples that's on the motor itself. And we got it on. You need to get your transmission up on a jack. Uh, it's a pretty daunting task in itself because you're going to have to get the transmission under the car first and then put it on the jack. Because Unless you can get your jack jack stands up high, which I just got these regular pro lifts here, which don't go up too high. I think they're like 17 inches up is what they'll go. But uh, right there uh, on the jack, that's pretty much the balancing point with the, uh, diff, uh, the bell housing meets the rear end there. And uh, the drain plug's right there in front of it too. 
drain plugs right there. Then you have the little stopper there for when you knock it with a hammer to knock the rear end off of the transmission. That's pretty much the balancing point there. So you want to get there, get it lined up in the middle so it's balanced and level. And then you'll jack it up to your uh, where your uh, input shaft goes into the, the um, clutch. So if you're doing it like me by, my, by yourself, then it's going to be pretty much a daunting task and you want to give yourself pretty much the biggest part of the day to do this. Because when you get it up there and you get it actually get it in, into the input shaft, into the clutch, you'll have to probably spin the input shaft a couple times to get it to go into the clutch. So you have to pull it back off a couple times. But uh, when you get on there, then you have to get the transmission to go into the nipples onto the motor. Just wiggle it, take, grab that. When you get it up there into the input shaft and it's going in, just grab the back of it while you're holding it and just kind of wiggle it on there. And then go ahead and install you a couple bolts to hold it on there and then remove the jack and go ahead and install the rest of them. Okay, I got my transmission on my motor now. Sorry I couldn't videotape it for you, it just it wasn't working out. It was actually being a pain in the butt to get on there. But uh, what you have to do is balance it on the transmission like I showed you with the jack. But after you jack it up a little ways, you're going to have to push up top. You're going to have to push up on the bell housing there. That's going to make the transmission want to slide back off the jack, which I had tons of problems with that. And thing falls off the jack, and you know you could probably break something or tear up something. So, like I said, I would not recommend this anyways. I would recommend just pulling the whole motor out and putting the transmission on and putting it all back in. It's so much simpler, and I could have done it in like two hours less of time. But like I say, it's doable. You can do it, because I just did it by myself. All the bell housing bolts are like 32 foot-pounds. But just get them as tight as you can, because you're probably not going to be able to get a torque wrench on half of them. After you have your transmission installed onto your motor, go ahead and uh, screw your bolts on everything. Also, make sure you have this uh, vent hoop here for the 5-speed. The automatic one will not work. You need one off the of 5-speed, so you need to find that. And also, as far as the hose goes, you ain't going to worry about the shape of the hose. You can just put new hose on. Basically, what I'm using is like a, a quarter-inch hose and just runs back to this. Basically, all it does is gives the gearbox a vent. And it has to be a high, it has to be higher than the, the vent box to get the good vent off of it because it vents off right there. So that's what that's for. And after you get it all torqued down and everything, don't forget to put your crank angle sensor in. We'll go over that when I do that. And your starter again and install your starter too. But we'll go over all that. Alright, as far as the gussets go, I have the automatic up front and the manual behind. They're both S14s. As you can see, there's no difference whatsoever between the S13 or S14 or automatic or manual. So you can use the gussets. Okay, when you're going to install your gussets, you got the uh, driver's side here. It gets the smaller gusset, but the passenger side gets the bigger gusset. And basically, all it does is uh, connects the motor and the transmission together. Gives it more of a support. It goes on just like that. The driver's side, you have uh, this one here. You need a, a long bolt with a nut because it just goes straight through. And then the next one over here, it's tapped out, so you just need a, a smaller bolt the screw in there and they torque down to 29 foot pounds and then the two holes on the passenger side for the gussets use uh, two small bolts with uh, nuts on them because they go straight through they're not tapped out they torque down to 29 foot pounds too and you want to go ahead and put your starter back on basically all it does is uh, it just slides in the hole and you run the, screw the bolts through and tighten it down which it runs in there and uh, the gears on the inside of the starter the gear right here that's what actually touches the flywheel and that's how that works so it connects to the flywheel so if, you, if it gets stuck on there and you can't get in then you know just 
turn your gear just a little bit if you can. Okay, when you're going to install your starter motor, make sure you get the five speed bolts. Because if you don't, the automatic ones are shorter, as you can see. These are automatic ones on the right side and the five speeds on the left side. If you got your starter motor in, go ahead and install your uh, crank angle sensor and hook up the wiring on it and uh, screw your 10 millimeter nut down and don't forget to put your metal plate on top. Before you put your shifter on, you want to go ahead and pour your uh, transmission fluid down in the hole here before uh, you go ahead and install your shifter. Basically underneath the striker plate to the sides of it, it's hard to see in here, but that's where it goes down into the into the transmission gearbox. That's where the transmission fluid goes in. This hole right here is where the end of your shifter goes into, and of course it bolts in right here. If your stock gasket is no good, we're just going to put a little bit of RTV on the bottom of the shifter before we put it in. And also, on this hole right here, don't forget to put your, your check ball and spring on there. Put the check ball in first and then the spring on top, and then put the shifter on and bolt it down. As far as the transmission fluid, you need uh, 2.7 quarts of uh, gear oil. I'm using the Redline 75W90. It's uh, really good stuff. I recommend it for anybody using it. So basically what you're going to do, you're going to need two of these. You're going to pour out about half of it, and then you'll have half left, and you're going to pour out another half of it. So three quarters of one bottle and two full ones would be 2.7 quarts. Okay, after you have all your transmission fluid in there, you have your check ball installed, your spring installed, Go ahead and take some lithium based grease and pack this little plastic thing in your uh, shifter with grease and go ahead and run a bead around on the inside of the bolt holes with RTV or your stock gasket if you still had it. And go ahead and install it. This little plastic thing right here goes in the hole right here on the striker arm. That's where that goes. Then you go ahead and bolt your four down and you got to get underneath the car to get the, the top two front bolts. They're uh, 12 millimeters. Just snug them down pretty tight. You ain't got to torque them down or anything. If you buy the aftermarket shifter like I did, it's the B&M knockoff. If you use the B&M, you ain't going to have no problem. But if you use the B&M knockoff, you need to take this plastic piece off of your uh, stock five-speed five shifter because the one they send is too thick and it won't fit down in the hole in the strike arm. Or if you don't have it, you could spend the time and just grind, grind and sand around until you get small enough to go in there. But it's got to be pretty exact or else you're going to have a lot of wobble in it because if it's if it's a lot smaller than this hole right here it's gonna have a lot of play in it and it's that's not gonna be good so make sure you do that and uh install your rtv around the butt holes and everything on the inside of the butt holes and stick it down on there When you're going to fill up your uh, power steering fluid, I haven't done mine yet, but just fill the reservoir up and then take your wheel, your steering wheel, after you got your ignition on and everything, your battery hooked up, turn your ignition on. Don't, don't start the car, just turn your ignition on. And then uh, turn the wheel all the way to the left lock and then all the way to the right lock a couple times just to get it, get it flowing through there and make sure it's all, you know, running through the lines good and everything and then, then top the reservoir back off. And the same with the brake booster and the master cylinder, make sure you got them topped off when you're done bleeding them.